Luke chapter 4 is where we are at as you are making your way there. By way of introduction, I, today's text, I'm, I'm reminded of a true story about a politician uh, who was running for re-election. He was actually the governor of uh, Massachusetts, I think. And anyway, he was, it was back in the early 50s running for re-election and he was, you know, doing the, uh, the circuit there, shaking hands and kissing babies and the whole bit. And uh, he goes to, uh, to a church barbecue. And, you know, the way this barbecue was structured is you, you go down the line and there are servers there putting your portion on your plate. And this guy hadn't eaten all day long. He was, he was starving. And so he comes to the, the chicken lady in the line there and she puts one piece of chicken on his plate. So very kindly, he, he asks her, he says, oh, can I have a second piece? She says, sorry, sorry, only one per customer. Well, at this point, he, he kind of gets a little prideful. He says, don't you know who I am? I'm the governor of this state. She goes, don't you know who I am? I'm the lady in charge of the chicken. Move along, mister. <laughs> <laughs> Sends him packing. Well, as we get into it today, the big idea of our text is about who's in charge. And really, we're going to see that it's Jesus Christ who's in charge, large and in charge. He is in power. He is in authority. Uh, and, uh, and we're going to see that. He's in charge over doctrine. He's in charge over demons. He's in charge over disease. And the big takeaway for us today is to understand that Jesus is in power and in authority in your life and in this world. And, and, and we can cast all of our cares upon him knowing that he cares for us. Uh, we, can, we, can, we can rest in him and we can trust that in him we have power to be overcomers. Amen? All right, Luke chapter 4. Let's pick it up in context. Verse 31 is where we left off. It says, Then he, Jesus, went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbaths, and they were astonished at his teaching, for his word was with, here's the word, authority. And you're going to see this word repeated several times in our text here. Jesus is here in the ministry in the Galilee region. He's in Capernaum. Capernaum's about 20 miles north of Nazareth. That's where we left him last week. He was basically run out of town at, in Nazareth. And so now here he is in Capernaum. Now, Capernaum was the hometown of Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Uh, and Capernaum was a, was a thriving town. Uh, it had a healthy local economy. It was very well populated. Uh, there was also a contingent of Roman troops that were headquartered there in Capernaum. And uh, Capernaum, I think, is how, well, people debate Capernaum, Capernaum, whatever, I'll call it Capernaum. And uh, anyway, listen, it's a target-rich environment because of the population, because of the mix of Jews and Gentiles, target-rich environment for the gospel. And so unsurprisingly, it becomes really Jesus' home base of operations. He doesn't stay here, and that's going to factor in significantly to the text as we continue. Um, but it will be sort of a base of operations from which uh, he goes out from. And so Jesus taught in the synagogues, in the synagogue in Capernaum often. I've actually been there. It's, a relatively, it's about the size of our chapel. Um, and uh, the, all that remains now is the floor. But it's, it's pretty moving to stand on the floor of the synagogue where you know that Jesus stood and preached. And Jesus, when he preached, when he taught, the text tells us that everybody was astonished at his teaching. And that word astonished there is, is interesting. It literally means to strike with a blow. And the idea is that when Jesus taught, it just, it just hits you right in the gut. Anybody ever been punched in the gut by Jesus when you sat in a teaching where the Lord just shows up and just, you know, catches you by surprise? This is what's going on here. And they, they were astonished at Jesus' teaching, unfortunately, because it was very new to them. See, up until this point, the rabbis would teach, and they didn't have authority in their teaching. When they would teach, their authority came from citing other teachers, popular, you know, leaders, or, you know, citing different traditions or whatever. And so their teaching was weak, 
But Jesus, when he taught, he taught straight from the scriptures and he applied it directly to the listeners' lives. Now, as I said, that was foreign to them. Hopefully, it's not foreign to you because we call that Sunday morning. Sunday morning here is where, listen, we're, we're not basing our teaching on, you know, the 10 steps to a better you or the six power principles of blah, 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 whatever. No, we go through the Word of God. We're teaching the Word of God, and we, we just teach it, in, in, hopefully in the power of the Holy Spirit, just tell you what it says and what it means, and we want to make some application and get you to sort of connect the dots and say, okay, contextually, this is where the Word was taught. That's what it meant then. Here's some bridging context, and listen, here's what it means for you and me, and we need to not just be hearers of the Word only, as James exhorts, but we need to be doers of the Word by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so <clears throat> that's what we seek to do here. We simply teach the Bible because that's where the power is, and that's the point. The power is in God's Word. Paul told Timothy, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Why? That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. <clears throat> this is where the power of God is, and it's the inspiration of God in His Word. In other words, that, 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 the idea of inspiration of God is that the Bible that you hold in your laps, all 66 books, were divinely, supernaturally inspired by God Himself. This is, these are the very words of God. Uh, Peter said this in 2 Peter chapter 1, he said, No prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. In other words, it's not from human origin. It's not from cooked up in man's mind. He says, For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Now that's a convenient claim, but there's many proofs in the Bible that authenticate that, in fact, this truly is the Word of God. And, of course, the, the, I think the biggest proof is that the Bible tells you ahead of time. It's called prophecy. The Bible prophesies things that are going to come to pass. And many prophecies in the Bible have already, having been given hundreds of years in advance, have already been fulfilled exactly the way the Bible says. Now, what other book can do that? You can go to the National Enquirer and look for something that's prophesied at the beginning of the year, all the new prophecies given, and, you know, not a single one of them come true. But what if all of them came true? You'd be like, well, somebody knows what they're talking about, right? And, and God says this, speaking through the prophet Isaiah... He says, I'm God and there's none like me, only I can tell you the future before it ever happens. J.I. Packer says that there's only one conclusion, that the Bible is God speaking. That's where the power is. The Bible is God speaking. And because it's God speaking, listen, it has the power to change your life. Just as we gather together, as the Word is taught, as we receive it, and as we prayerfully just meditate on God's Word and take a walk with it, and not, our, not hearers only, but we seek to live it out obediently, what we discover is, well, th this has the power to change my life because it's God speaking. Paul said this to the Th Thessalonians. He said, we never stop thanking God <coughs> that when you received His message from us, you didn't think... Our, of our words as, as mere human ideas, you accepted what we said as the very word of God, which of course it is, and this word continues to work in you who believe. In other words, the Spirit of God speaks through the word of God to transform the child of God into the image of the Son of God. That's how it works. Now, we don't just think that to be true around here. We know that that is true. It's our number one value as a church. We, we trust God's word as the only foundation for truth and our only hope for change. And, and we have an ocean of testimonies of folks. As we gather together, as we go through God's word, we see people who come in with marriages that are, that are a train wreck. And as they listen to God speaking his word, and he has a lot to say about marriage, and as they receive it by faith and begin to live out obediently the lessons that the precepts that God teaches in his word, we begin to see those marriages healed. We begin to see families strengthened. We see people that are saddled with deep hurt and wounds and, and years of baggage and they, that God lifts those burdens. 
And he wants to do that in your life as well. And it's not going to come through the wisdom of men. It's not going to come through, you know, some power principles that we're going to knit together that you could have listened to on Dr. Phil or through Oprah or whoever, the, whatever the wisdom of the age is. No, it's God's word that changes our life. And this is what Jesus did here. He, he shows up, he reads God's word in authority and power. He begins to apply it to the hearer's lives and they marvel. They're blown away. Total gut bunch time. We continue verse 33. Now in the synagogue, there was a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon and he cried out with a loud voice saying, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are. The Holy One of God. Now put yourself there in the synagogue as this, as this demon-possessed man begins to just lose it there in front of everybody. That it would be a little unsettling, right? Years ago, several years ago, right here in this room, we had somebody come in, and, and I, I, I'm not saying he was demon-possessed, I don't know, but the guy, he was sitting right over here, and all of a sudden in the middle of the, the service, he raises his hand. To, was anybody here when that went down? You know what? I, yeah, several of you guys. That was a freaky day, wasn't it? This guy raises his hand, and I'm like, I, I, I just sort of see him there with his hand. I'm like, buddy, it's not question and answer time. <laughs> you know, when we're all done, you know, I'll be up front. You can talk to me. Well, he just he put his hand back down, but he was squirming in his seat, and I knew that it was going to get ugly. And sure enough, like uh, just a couple of minutes goes by. And then the guy leaps out of his seat and he starts screaming at me. You remember that when he did that? It's like, the guy's screaming at me. And so, uh, so I said, you need to leave right now. And the ushers, thankfully, helped him find the door. Um, we'll just put it politely that way and escorted him out. But it freaked everybody out. I mean, sadly, we had a, a, you know, some new families visiting the church and they were out of here, man, as soon as this guy... <laughs> just lost his lid. And so here this guy is, and he, and he jumps up in the middle of the synagogue, fronting Jesus off. Verse 35, but Jesus rebuked him, saying, be quiet and come out of him. Literally, what he's saying here in the Greek, he says, shut up and get out. That's literally what he says. I love, love me some Jesus right here. Shut up and get out. And when the demon had thrown him, meaning the guy that he was possessing in their midst, it came out of him and it did not hurt him. And then they were all amazed and they spoke among themselves saying, what a word this is for with authority and, here's the word again, power, he, Jesus, commands the unclean spirits and they come out. And the report about him went out into every place in the surrounding region. Now, we read this previously that the report about him had gone out. And in that previous instance, in the last chapter, or earlier in the chapter, the word that's used when it talks about the report of Jesus, it was a rumor that, was, that went out about Jesus. But here, when it says the report about him went out, it's the roar. Literally, is what they're saying. So now people are just like, you cannot believe Jesus of Nazareth and what's going on and what, what power he's got. So the people are astonished, not just at the power of his preaching, now they're astonished at the power that he has over the demonic realm. Now for starters, let's just take note that demon possession is a real thing. It is a real thing. This is one of literally dozens of accounts in the New Testament that talk about somebody being possessed demonically. Now, the Bible teaches that when Satan fell, that he took a third of the angels with him. And so what we have now are uh, not only Satan, who is operating within the world, but there, uh, there's a third of the whole uh, angelic realm that is now de demons that are there with, with Satan here on earth operating with Satan. And the Bible says that they are organized and led by Satan. Ephesians 6.12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. See, oftentimes we will, we will ascribe 
powers to Satan that he doesn't have. Um, God has divine supernatural powers. He's, one of the things about God is that he's omnipresent. He's everywhere all the time. And sometimes in our minds, we think that Satan is everywhere all the time. He, he, the person of Satan is not everywhere all the time because he's not omnipresent. He doesn't have that power like God does. But what Satan does have is he has a third of the angels that fell with him. And so Satan has an organized rank and file that, that is actively at work throughout all the world. And so we have to contend with demonic forces. And so that's the bad news. The good news is that if you are a child of God, if Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, and if the Holy Spirit has come to take residence in you, then you cannot be demon-possessed. You can't be oppressed by, by demonic forces. You can be tormented by demonic forces forces. You can be, uh, you know, led astray by demonic influence, but you cannot be demon-possessed. Uh, John, speaking in 1 John chapter 4, was talking about this idea of demonic spiritual attack, and he said, little children, speaking to those that have Christ as the Lord and Savior, he says, you're not from, you're, or you are from God, and you have overcome them. And in contextually, what he's talking about when he says them, he's talking about the demonic realm and demonic forces that are actively at work in the world. And he says, you're from God. You've overcome them. Uh, for he who is in you, speaking of God, speaking of the person of the Holy Spirit who dwells in you, is greater than he who is in the world, speaking about Satan and his demons. So Christians cannot be possessed by demons. I know some people who debate that, um, and I think the scripture is clear that you cannot be, but there is no argument that Christians can be tempted and they can be oppressed by the demonic realm. Um, we, we see, you know, we see that in Ephesians 6, that, that, that's what it's talking about. And toward that end, this idea of the demonic realm active and at work and seeking to oppress you, seeking to, you know, de deceive you and lead you astray, really, there's, there's a couple of primary areas where we see the enemy at work and moving in that way. He traffics in lies and he traffics in fear. And these are the two primary ways that, that we see the enemy working demonically trying to lead people astray. It goes back as far as the garden. You think about Eve in the garden, and, and uh, Satan shows up. He's trying to tempt her to partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that, that the Lord told him not to. And, uh, and Eve's protesting. She's like, hey, God told us not to do that. He says, we'll die if we do that. And the, the enemy says, you're not going to die which is a lie. You're not going to surely die, for God knows in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good from evil. What does Satan do here? He, he First of all, he throws out a lie. You're not going to die, which, of course, she will. And, and, he, throw, and he plays on her fears. Basically, he says, look, God's keeping something good from you. And so trafficking in lies and in fear, what does he get, say, get Eve to do? She sins against God. She does what she should not have done. She buys into the lie. And Romans chapter 5 says that sin then entered into the world and subsequently death spread to all mankind. And so, so that's temptation. That's oppression. But here in our text, that's not what's going on. You have a guy who is, the Bible makes clear, is demonically possessed. Now, this raises a question, what is a demon-possessed man doing coming to church? What's he, why would the demon bring this guy, of all places, to the synagogue to church? Well, obviously, to bring oppression and to, to bring disruption and to, to you know, attack wherever he can, certainly that's going on. But listen, understand that where this demon-possessed man is concerned, the, the demon that is possessing him doesn't have a problem with him going to a place where he's going to receive religion. Religion doesn't freak the enemy out at all. It's relationship that freaks the enemy out. But he could care less about religion. And so what happens is, because a half-truth is a full lie... The enemy's got no problem leading someone who is, who is possessed by, by a demon, leading them to, to go to a church if there's no gospel that's being presented there. Because the gospel is where the power is. And if the gospel isn't being presented, then there's no power there. 
Now, Isaiah talks about this idea very clearly. Isaiah 64, verse 6. Put it on the screen for you. He says, we are all infected and impure with sin. All mankind. He says, when we display our righteous deeds... They are nothing but filthy rags. The idea is on your best day, your best works are as filthy rags. In other words, they, you can't earn a right standing with God by your works. He goes on to say that, that like autumn leaves, we wither and fall and our sins sweep us away like the wind. What he's talking about here is that if you're religious minded where you, know, you operate in a sense of my good works outweighing my bad works and I'm going to earn a right standing by God with the works that I do, he says, you know, you're going to die. You're going to wither away. It's going to be like the autumn leaves. That's what your life will be like. The point is, is that without the gospel, the church has nothing to offer but works-based righteousness. And the enemy all day long will gladly lead people to that kind of a place because there's no power in it. This is, you, you want to go to a place where you're burdened down with rules and regulations and rituals all day long, he'll take you there. This is what Jesus was talking about in Matthew's gospel, Matthew 23. He's, he's confronting the religious leaders of his day and he says to them, what sorrow awaits you teachers of, the, of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cross land and sea to make one convert and then you turn that person into twice the child of hell than you yourselves are. No gospel, no power. Paul said this to the Romans, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. To the Ephesians, Paul said this, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things that we have done, so none of us can boast about it. So this demon, he's got no problem with taking this guy to, the, to, the, to, the, to the, the temple there, taking this guy to the synagogue. He's got no problem with that because he's like, hey, they're just going to load him down with rules and regulations and about keeping the law and all that. Hey, he can go there all day long. But what the demon failed to realize is that we got a pinch hitter today. Now batting for the Capernaum Crusaders, it's Jesus Christ. He's up to bat. And so Jesus is there, he preaches the word, and this guy loses, this, this demon inside this guy, go away, why are you interfering with us, Jesus of Nazareth, we got a good thing going on here, why are you interfering with this, have you come to destroy us, and the answer is, yeah, as a matter of fact, I have. <clears throat> then he says this, he goes, I know who you are, you're the holy one of God. And this is going to come up later, the demons, you know, crying out who he is. It's interesting that this demon knows who Jesus is even before the people know. He recognizes it. But listen, knowing who Jesus is is not enough. It's not enough to know who he is. This is what James was talking about in James chapter 2. He, he's talking about this, this idea of having faith, and if you have true faith, then it should show up in how you live your lives. He's talking about how faith without works is dead, and he says, you say that you have faith, for you believe that there is one God, good for you, whoop-dee-dee. He says, even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. In other words, the point that he's making is knowing that who Jesus is doesn't qualify you to be saved and forgiven. That it's, that it's how you respond, that you make him your Lord and Savior, that you surrender your life to him, that you confess and make him Lord. And obviously, this demon in this man, he hasn't surrendered. He's not saying, oh, you're the Lord Jesus Christ. I bow down and worship you. He's saying, you're the Lord. Get out of here. We want nothing to do with you. And so Jesus says, that's it. Everybody out of the pool, you're gone. Get out. And so just does this work. Now, in this day, the demons working and people being demon-possessed, as I said, it, it was a common thing. You saw it. They recognized it. And people, religious leaders, would operate in what they called uh, performing the rites of exorcism. 
And so if they encountered somebody who was a demon-possessed man or a woman, they'd make a big production out of trying to cast the demon out. And this, this big elaborate deal, they'd wave a gold ring and there were lots of words and they would have these incantations that they would do. But here in contrast, Jesus simply says, shut up and get out. And, and it says there in verse 36 and verse 37 when Jesus did this, then they, they were all amazed and they spoke among themselves saying, what a word this is. No, no big elaborate production, no incantations, no you know, gyrations. He just, for, with authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits and they come out. And the, the report, the roar of him goes out into every place in the surrounding region. Verse 38, we continue. It says, um, Now he arose from the synagogue and he entered Simon's house, but Simon's wife's mother was sick with a high fever. And they made request of him, request of Jesus concerning her, Peter's mother-in-law. So he stood over her and he rebuked the fever and it left her and immediately she arose and she served them. Now again, Get what's going on here. What has Jesus done? The idea is his power. The power that Jesus has. And with, with this power, he rebukes the demon and it leaves. And now hear what happens again. He rebukes the disease and it leaves. Now, a lot of people, you know, Luke's a medical doctor, and so as he's writing this down, he's speaking in medical terms. He says she was sick with a high fever. A lot of people make the connection that there was a high rate of malaria in Capernaum because of the marshy areas that are, that are in that area. And so they, they speculate, well, the pathogen probably was that it was, you know, some malaria kind of related disease from, from mosquitoes. That's not the point. It's not about the pathogen. It's about the power. The power that Jesus has, not only power over demons, but power over disease. And so what happens here, recognizing that Jesus has power, the, the family members of, of, of this, this gal, this, you know, Peter's wife's mother, his mother-in-law, they, they say to him, Lord, heal her. Can you heal her? Now, I want to stop right there, and I want to remind all of us that The Bible exhorts us, you and me, that we're to do the same thing. That we're to come to the Lord and we're we're supposed to ask him to heal. As a matter of fact, in James, he he asks a question. He says, is anyone anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sins, he'll be forgiven. The attitude here, the idea, this isn't a magic formula. You know, some people, we talked about demon possession, and some people are like, you know, demon hunters. I'm going to go around, I'm going to look for the demon, and I'm going to cast you out in Jesus' name. And it it becomes sort of like this this formulaic kind of thing. You know, you see Paul in in the book of Acts, that he's he's encountered this demon-possessed gal, she's bugging him, and he casts the demon out. Uh, command you in the name of the Lord Jesus to come out of her. And, and she, the demon does, and it creates a lot of trouble for Paul. And, and then there's these people in the very next chapter. That happens in Acts chapter 18 and Acts chapter 19. Then some people, they want to do the same thing, these Jews that go out. And they're, they're the demon show. You know, they're going out. We're, we're hunting demons. We're going to cast them out. And so they try, they encounter this guy, and they try casting out this demon. And they say, in the name of Jesus who, who Paul preaches, we command you to come out. And the demon famously looks at him and he says, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? And, and the man jumps on him, and seven, seven guys jumps on him, and beats him up, and they go running naked out of the house because this demon works them over, you know? And some people, the, what happened there, what well, was this formulaic kind of thing? It was kind of like, oh, you know, Jesus is the, the special, the name of Jesus is a special incantation that we say to have victory. Over. No, Jesus is who possesses the power. Jesus is the one that will have the victory over the demonic realm. 
And Jesus is the one who will have victory over disease. And so some people, they'll read James 5, verses 14 15, and they see it in the sense of, oh, this is the incantation. This is a special formula that, okay, we get a person together, we ask the elders, we anoint them with oil, we pray over them, and, and there, that, that's the magic words that's going to happen. No, it doesn't go down that way. It doesn't go down that way at all. Now, the promise is, that the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. But this doesn't necessarily mean that God will accomplish that physically here and now. I'll tell you for sure that if you pray the prayer of faith, that God will heal you of your greatest sickness, which is the sickness of sin that leads to death. And he will raise you up from the dead into newness of life. And so for sure, the prayer of faith will ultimately heal you, will ultimately save you. The Bible promises that to be absent from the body is to be present, from the Lord, present with the Lord. The Bible promises that in his presence is fullness of joy. The Bible promises that when we die, that we will receive a resurrection body, a new body. And people trip up on this. Listen, can I just remind you, God created the heavens and the earth with a spoken word, and he made you out of dirt. And he breathed life into you. Don't get tripped up over the fact that God's going to make you a new body. He promises it in his word. It's going to happen. And that new body will not be subject to sin. It will not be subject to sickness. It will be perfect. And so a day is coming when this absolutely will be ultimately fulfilled in heaven. But, so, so we, but we believe at the same time, listen, if God wants to heal you physically, if you do come forward as you should, and if you are anointed with oil, which is not, again, an incantation or whatever, oil is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. And I would encourage you, if you're sick today, if you're dealing with a sickness and illness, the end of the service today, come forward. Let the elders pray for you. Let us anoint you with oil in obedience to the word. We believe that God can heal you. And we're going to pray and we're going to say, Lord, please heal. And we see a picture of this in Mark's gospel. There, it, it, I'll put it on the screen for you. A man with leprosy came and he knelt in front of Jesus and he begged him to be healed. He said, and listen to these words of faith that come from this leper. He says, if you are willing, you can heal me and make me clean. What a beautiful testimony. He, he, basically what he's saying is, look, I know you can heal me if you want to, if it's your will. That's exactly the heart of James chapter 5 there. Lord, if you, if you want to heal me, you can. And moved with compassion, the text goes on to say, Jesus reached out and touched him. And he said, I am willing, be healed. I want you to think about this man for a minute. That section of scripture there, Mark chapter 1, when it says a man with leprosy came. In the original language, what it says is that this man was saturated with leprosy. He was filled with leprosy from head to toe. Leprosy is a wasting disease. And you know what? It's, communi it's communicated, it's transmitted through touch. And so if you had leprosy, and you, you know, then there's varying stages of it, but the moment you had the slightest sign of leprosy, nobody would touch you because that's how it was transmitted. They're like, I don't want to catch it. And so lepers, they had to walk through the town. They had to shout out, unclean, unclean, so that nobody would bump into them. Can you imagine living your life that way? And Jesus touched him, and he healed him. Can you imagine how many years? This guy's filled with leprosy. How many years had it been that he'd gone without human touch? Somebody loving him just enough to touch him. Do you know when you're sick? I mean, sometimes I'm sick, and I just think, you know, the times I've, I've had a fever, and just my wife will lay her hand on my head. And just having her touch is... is it's medicine to my soul. And, and so we read here that Jesus, he stands over Simon's mother-in-law, and it says that he rebukes the, 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 the disease. He rebukes the fever, and the fever lifts. But, you know, this is also in, in Matthew's gospel, gives us a little more detail about this. Mark's gospel gives us also a little more detail about it. And both Matthew and Mark say that Jesus touched her when he healed her. That Jesus reached out and touched her hand, Matthew's gospel says. Mark adds a little bit more. He touched her hand and he lifted her up. And listen, there's power in the name of Jesus. 
And the Lord wants to touch you and he wants to heal you. And if you have disease, if you have demonic temptation, if you have those things that you're going through, it's the Lord and his power that is available to us. That's the message here. Jesus wants this loud and clear. He wants us to understand that he's more powerful than anything that you're dealing with. More powerful than any of these things. He's able to overcome all of these things. So beautifully, this leper says, Lord, if you want to, you can heal me. If you will. Lord, I'm, I'm going to trust in your will. You want to heal me now? You can heal me now. If in your sovereign will, <clears throat> the healing isn't for now, and, and you just want me to trust in you and trust in the hope that I have in you, I know you're all powerful. I'm going to trust in that. And so this is what Jesus does here with Simon's mother-in-law. He touches her. He heals her. <clears throat> Verse 40, when the sun was setting, all those who had any that were sick with various diseases, they brought them to him, and, the, and he laid his hands, get this, on every one of them. Jesus laid his hands on every one of them, and he healed them. And the demons also, they came out many, uh, they came out of many crying out and saying, you are the Christ, the Son of God. And he rebuking them did not allow them to speak, for they knew that he was the Christ. Now, why does Jesus rebuke them? Well, he's healing them because he wants everybody to know that, that he is the Messiah, come to heal, come to forgive sins, come to set us free. He wants everybody to see the demonstration of the power of God. But he does not want these demons crying out, hey, you're the son of God. Why? Well, because what he does not want to take place is he doesn't want his identity to be revealed on Satan's terms and not his own terms. See, what Jesus understood, and we will see this on, uh, on Palm Sunday, we see it manifested, you know, very strongly. The people wanted a Messiah that was going to come and to take over and, and you know, kick butt and take names and, and you know, kick Rome out and all of that. They were looking for the conquering king. And Jesus is our conquering king, but in God's timing. Him being the conquering king will come later, but it starts first with him being the suffering servant. Because Jesus came to take the sins of the world upon himself and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so Jesus does not want everybody looking to him as the conquering king. He wants the people looking to him as the, the, the Messiah come to take away the sins of the world, come to heal us, and it's by his stripes that we are healed. And so this is why he's rebuking the enemy and saying, you know, shut up and get out because this isn't about your agenda, this is about my agenda. And so we continue now, verse 42, it says, Now when it was day, he departed, and he went into a deserted place, and the crowd sought him and came to him, and they tried to keep him from leaving them. You think? Jesus is healing everybody. Like, you wouldn't want him to leave either. And so they try to keep him from leaving them, but he said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, because for this purpose I have been sent. Remember that. For this purpose I have been sent. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Galilee. My final point, if you give me your, give me your attention real quickly, here's what I'll say. Jesus had tremendous success operating in the power of the Spirit. When Jesus is doing this work, he's not healing everybody as the Son of God, operating in, the, in his own power. He's operating in the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is connecting with God the Father. He's seeking God the Father for, for, for his leading, for his guiding. And understand this, that as a man, I put myself in this position. Now, now if, I, if, if Capernaum were my ministry, I would be tempted to size up it and go, everybody loves me. They all want me here. There's all these people that are being healed. They're all just marveling. This roar is going out about the power of the preaching. I might be thinking to myself, that's a pretty sweet gig. I'm going to just stick around. I'll just hang out right here. What, is, what does Jesus do? He defies all the conventional sizing up stuff of the external. He goes to God the Father and says, what do you want? And God the Father says, well, I want you to, to, to spread this around. Don't stay here. 
You can come back here, but you need to go to everybody. Everybody needs this message, right? So Jesus being led by the Father, understanding, no, 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 my, this isn't my purpose. That's my purpose. And we need to do the same thing. We need to understand so often what we want to do, and, and I'm, I'm guilty of this a lot of times, where I look at the external and I say, this is great by all measures, by all accounts. You know, everything, everything's great. No, no, no. We need to be able to go away. We need to go in prayer. We need to be able to say, Lord, what do you want? I don't plan on going anywhere, by the way. This isn't me setting up some elaborate thing saying, you know, <laughs> things are going sweet here and I'm leaving. No, but you know what? God knows my heart. I'll go wherever he tells me to go. Whenever he tells me to go. And we need to be doing the same thing. We got to understand there's power in the name of Jesus to overcome Satan, to overcome sin, to overcome the temptations that you have, to overcome all of the things that throw themselves at you, to overcome the accolades of men and the praises, to overcome the things in the outward that say, hey, look, this is great, this is what you should do. Now, there's a way that seems right to a man, but the Bible says its way is the end of death. We gotta be going to the Lord. We need to get away. We need to have time alone with God. Lord, what is it that you want? And the power and the purpose comes when we spend time alone with God and he says, this is the way, walk in this way. Do this. There's power to heal. 